I'm now going to hand over to Samuel Mokorosi, who's head of deals and origination in JSC. Good morning, Sam. I think you're going to take us through and lead us through the panel discussion. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Leon. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for spending time with us um, as we talk about the opportunities that we find uh, in the South African capital markets, um, specifically through our inward listing uh, framework. I'm going to ask uh, the panelists to put, please uh, put their cameras on. Um, Richard Stout is the head of um, equities and uh, capital markets at Standard Bank. Uh, Richard, welcome. Um, Will Ridge is at Investec Corporate and Institutional Banking, and he is the head of equities there. And uh, Patricia Kulafesta is uh, in the primary markets team at uh, the JSE and responsible for the origination of uh, new listings. And I must say, she's actually the, uh, the, the, the real kind of hero behind this event, uh, putting everything together. So thank you um, for all of that, uh, Patricia. Um, maybe, uh, Richard, we can start with you. Just, um, you know, in terms of your space as an advisor um, and, and, and having uh, concluded uh, some of these uh, inward listings, um, anything that you can tell us about the process uh, how it's worked for you and your clients, um, and 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 really just uh, your 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 encouragement for the audience this morning. Yeah, thanks, Sam, and and, and good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, look, I, I think as as we just heard through through the video clip, um, you know, the, the the process really is 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 very straightforward and and very streamlined. Um, you know, I think with the fast track listing now, you can list within. 21 days. Yeah, that is a pretty phenomenal achievement when you think about it. Mm. Um, and you know, the, the 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 process really is one whereby the JSC is comfortable uh, if the company is already listed on a recognised international exchange, which would include the likes of a London Stock Exchange. The JSC is comfortable to place reliance upon, I guess, the disclosure and reporting regime of that market. And that's really what allows uh, these listings to proceed, you know, on, on a very short time fuse, uh, and generally with 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 relatively little difficulty. Um, so, so you know, we we've done it for a number of clients at Standard Bank, um, and and it really does work very well. Um, and 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 obviously, then as we'll come on to talk about, no doubt, you know, that that then gives corporates the ability to access. A really attractive, deep, and broad pool of, of, of liquidity within the South African market. Great, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Richard. Um, Will you, you you chat to investors as well? Um, you know, what is the attraction for South African investors? Um, and and as Valdin spoke about, you know, our our capital markets are quite deep, and and our investor base is 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 broad. But Will, maybe just tell us about from an investor perspective, why this inward listing um, kind of framework is, is, is quite useful for them and, um, and, and, and why it's uh, proven so popular. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to, to sort of take a step back and sort of set the scene, and I think uh, maybe just provide uh, some color on, on what I really see as the crux of this opportunity, right? So for, for everyone on this call, there's a piece of regulation in South Africa called Reg 28 which prescribes how much money a pension fund is allowed offshore, right? And, and, and that prescribes that 70% of pension fund assets need to remain in SA, okay? And to the serious uh, CEO's comments earlier, that means that number one, not only is every deep pool of capital in South Africa, right? So relative to other emerging markets, our domestic save, savings framework and network is much more developed, much deeper, but it also means this capital is tracked, right? I mean, and on very, very conservative assumptions. I mean, you're looking at something like, you know, $500 billion in, this, in savings that, that cannot leave South Africa, right? And, and to that point, domestic managers are trying to manage this RAND risk, which is very real. I mean, the currency is depreciated. They just call it uh, single mid digits forever. Um, and they are very, very engaged in providing a hedge to pensioners uh, to offset that, right? And so I think, I think that is a very, very important thing to understand, right? Um, the second thing here is I think, you know, I, I would encourage people to get down here. And again, the, the serious CEO's uh, uh, comments were interesting, but 
you know, it is a, um, the, the, the quality of the asset managers down here, I think would surprise a lot of people for the right reasons, right? So over a period of time, um, we have in-housed the management of that offshore portion of your portfolios. You know, so rather than someone like a T. Rose Schroeder's BlackRock managing that over time, these investors manage it now. Um, and again, given the composition of our market, they've built out their expertise uh, across a number of big global sectors. I mean, to understand the JSC, you have to understand, you know, global tech, global miners, global luxury, global beverages. You know, I'm just talking to stocks like Process, Richmond, ABN, British American Tobacco, et cetera. So that global knowledge base really is there. And there's a very deep understanding of the other sort of uh, business models that, um, that, that, that link into uh, you know, the local benchmarks, et cetera. But hopefully that frames um, a bit of opportunity set and the extent to which you know, people have had real success in terms of getting better rating because there's just a finite uh, choice of stocks down in South Africa with a very big track pool of capital. I'll leave it there. No, great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, you, you mentioned some sectors. Um, you, you know, when you're on the phone to your uh, institutional investor clients, what are some of the, 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 the sectors that um, the clients are saying, shucks, you know, we've got a broad space and a, and a broad uh, market in South Africa, but, but there are some industries that are, are, are lacking. And I suppose some geographies that are lacking um, on our exchange as well. So, so just a view on, on, on what kind of, if, if folks could wave a magic wand, you know, what, what, what else they'd like to see um, on the exchange from a sector and maybe from a geographic exposure perspective? Sure, so um, framing the geographic, uh, it's actually a problem, is, is really interesting, right? So um, it, South Africa is obviously a very cyclical economy in itself, right? But again, given how our markets developed, miners were obviously, a, um, at, at the forefront of that development, right? So the likes of BHP, Anglo have always played a big role in our market as are the big sort of precious metals miners that are essentially global companies now, right? Um, but you then have the likes of uh, NASPA's huge success with Tencent in China, um, Richmond obviously with a massive China focus, AB InBev with a massive Chinese business. I mean, you're starting to get the theme here, right? Just the composition of our index has emerged into a very cyclical and fairly one-way China bet. My investors are desperate for some, div some diversification uh, and largely defensive diversification. They feel quite exposed. Um, I, I would say, and, and, and we've seen it. I mean, Richard, you know, there, there's been some other processes we worked on, um, you know, recently where you're seeing uh, big FMCG companies, you know, look towards the JSC. And that's where I see real opportunity, right? I think if it's more defensive, consumer-oriented, and again, something to diversify what I perceive to be some pretty outsized China risk at the moment, at the same point in time as the risks to that market are, are more elevated than, than they've been for a very long time. I'm telling you, if you can solve that problem for domestic portfolio managers, you're going to see a tangible change in rating. And you will start to see this SA market, you know, again to that serious call, you'll start to see the price getting made in South Africa because that solves a real problem for domestic managers in terms of portfolio construction. No, brilliant. Thanks, 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 Will. I think I think um, I think the China story is an interesting one. Um, we'll have to see how that unfolds. Certainly, this year has been one of volatility in that space, and so um, completely understand your, your your views where they're coming from from a from a from a risk perspective and and a defensive risk perspective um, as as well. Um, maybe Richard, back to you in terms of just. Um, you know, um, the, the, the CEO of Sirius mentioned around uh, fungibility of uh, the shares, um, trading the shares across the two registers, uh, in his case, obviously the UK um, and the South African register. Do you want to just maybe unpack that a little bit more in terms of what you've seen from a client perspective? And maybe one of the things that you can do is then link that into index inclusion, which, which has obviously been quite an important um, key success factor for our dual uh, listed counters in that, you know, again, to, to, to go back to serious, that inclusion in the South African property index has helped uh, serious gain traction uh, from, from investors. So maybe you wanna just tell us about those, how those two link the register, the fungibility of the assets, plus then the uh, the index. 
Yes, sure. So I guess very simply put on the fungibility point, um, you know, the, the, the JSC has essentially established very efficient links with a number of international exchanges um, that allow for the fungibility of shares across those, those exchanges. So, you know, it obviously started back in, in the early 2000s, late 1990s, with the likes of Anglo-American SAB Miller at the time of Mutual setting up dual primary listings and essentially kind of creating a system whereby you could buy a share on one exchange and then move it across to the, the, the other exchanges register. And, and, and that's important in the sense that it does mean that the, 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 the kind of risk of segregating distinct pools of liquidity is somewhat mitigated. There is therefore fluidity across the two exchanges and investors can benefit from the liquidity across the whole market, just not just the the exchange on which they would naturally trade. Um, it's also important in the sense that it does create an efficient market as well. So, um, you know, the, the arbitrage opportunity that perhaps you see in other markets where dual listings exist, where that fungibility doesn't exist, you can find that, you know, the, the share price on one exchange is materially different to the, the, the price on the other in, in, the, in, in the kind of equivalent currency. That's important for issuers. You know, issuers don't want to find themselves in a situation where they have that 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 big arbitrage because it, it creates inefficiencies when it comes to them raising capital. So, um, so, so the JSE is is very much a global exchange plugged into these other exchanges. And and obviously, as I said, it started with London, but we've done uh, you know we've helped corporates list on exchanges like Frankfurt, uh, on Euronext, uh, Brussels, and and essentially wherever you wherever you go um you know our view is you can trust that you can put in place if one system doesn't already exist a very efficient fungibility mechanism and coming to your second point about indexation inclusion this this is quite an important and, and valuable point to, to raise so often in in capital markets globally companies will only really be eligible for indexation on the exchange where they have their primary listing um the jsc is, is slightly different the JSE essentially says, if you have a minimum portion of your register, of, of your total shares and issues sitting on our register, then you will qualify uh, for indexation inclusion through the JSE uh, index series. Um, that, that minimum threshold is undemanding. It's essentially 1%. Uh, and I think there's a rounding. So really, all you need is half a percent of your issued share capital sitting on the JSE. And that allows you to, to gain indexation inclusion. Now, obviously, if you stay at that level, the index weighting is driven by the volume held on the JSE, not the, 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 the kind of total market cap. But nevertheless, it's important. It, it allows you to get a foothold and it means that you have relevance to investors in the South African market. You, you are on the index, and so many investors uh, are therefore forced to at least pay attention to you. As, as a listed company. So, you know, very different to other markets where you can list on their exchange, but because you don't get indexation inclusion, you're at some risk of becoming a bit of an orphan stock. No one really knows much about you. No one really has to care too much about you because you're not part of the benchmark. So I guess for anyone thinking about, you know, coming down uh, to Joe Bergen listing, I think aside from the ease of listing, aside from the deep pool of capital that we've talked about, Reality is you, you can know for certain that you will be relevant as well. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Richard. I'm, I'm glad you, you, you mentioned that uh, wh while you can get into the game at half a percent, uh, it's not good to stay there, right? Because you actually no, no, <laughs> cause you actually want to be a, a significant part of that index. Um, and so that is something that, that we as a JSE work with issuers and, and and of course advisors like yourselves to just guide them through that process of 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 um um getting as much of that register on the uh, on the south african side as possible um and um maybe to then move to you patricia um so so so, so now that uh, will myself and, and richard have, have have done somewhat of a job of uh and convincing people that that listing on um, the exchange via an inward listing is, is is a great way to raise capital and maybe we'll come back to to Richard and Will specifically around once you listed how has it been to to raise capital on on, on the JSE but Patricia maybe you can talk us through 
um, the actual uh, criteria for listing on, on, on the exchange uh, in an inward listing framework. Sure, Sam. Um, so I think the point has been well iterated, the fact that the JSC has been working um, quite a lot in tweaking and catering our listing requirements for a smooth and efficient listing process. Um, and that's why we have bought these innovative ways of accessing the market, fast track listings, standard listings. And I think also the point that I wanted to make there is from a standard listing perspective, um, the nuance across the JSC and LSE in particular is that standard listed issuers don't get index eligibility. Um, however, if those standard listed companies inward list on the JSC, they are eligible for index inclusion if they meet the free float and net market cap and all those other requirements um, for, the, for the index itself. So maybe Sam, just to kind of touch on your points, um, I mean, ways of accessing and what the requirements are um, of accessing the capital markets is, you know, I want to touch on direct listings. That's a way of listing without necessarily raising capital. We refer to it by listing by way of introduction. Main rationale there again is liquidity, arbitrage, indexation and profile. Um, and I think, again, the indexation, particularly for standard listed issuers, you know, if you list on the JSC is a significant um, value add. So over the past decade, we have, um, or even more than a decade, we have listed over 100 companies by way of um, direct listings or way of introductions. Then, of course, you've got the normal um, equity listing slash IPO. So that's really where our secondary listing framework kicks in. You raise capital, you float in the market. And I think, you know, the important thing is that, you know, whilst we understand that London in particular is a, is a hive of activity at the moment in terms of capital raisings. You know, the important thing is it, uh, to note is that, you know, our investors are looking for additional exposure. So as these companies are trotting the globe to raise capital and perhaps are not able to place all their shares and raise the capital that they're looking at raising is that they do consider the JSC. We've got a streamlined, efficient way of accessing the market. Come and speak to our local asset managers. And you'll probably find, um, if it's of course, it's a, if it's a good company, that you'll probably be quite well subscribed from the South African investor perspective. So just, um, and then of course, maybe one point to to also mentioned is um, another way of accessing the market is depository receipts, very similar to GDRs. We've got the sponsored and unsponsored. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't fit into the um, Reg 28 classification that uh, Will was speaking about. So these instruments are currently still considered as foreign instruments, but this may change at a point in time. And of course, that's also an easier way of accessing the market um, in South Africa. So what are the requirements? I mean, just as a very high level in terms of our secondary listing framework, um, we have um, 10 with one additional one that has recently been added, 11 exchanges that we um, accredited, uh, accredited for secondary listing um, uh, uh, framework. So really what those exchanges are is the Australian Stock Exchange, the New York NASDAQ, Euronext, Brussels, uh, Luxembourg, um, the LSE, of course. Um, and there we look at the premium, we look at the standard and we look at the AIM, TSX, uh, Euronext, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, and the Swiss exchange. And recently, um, of course, we've been looking at the, at the Singapore exchange. So um, these exchange or these um, accredited exchanges qualify you for a secondary listing, which means that you access the market, you issue a pre-listing and a prospectus into our market. And of course, you raise the capital. Um, our turnaround times in terms of appro approval processes are relatively quick. We've got a 10-day turnaround time from informal to formal and to the extent that all the information is at hand you can probably execute a listing as what we heard in the in the interview relatively quickly in fact the fast track listing process has probably been the most expedited way of of listing and raising capital um, and there what the requirements are is that if you have an issuer or a company that's been listed on either new york london australia or toronto for longer than 18 months you can access the market with the pre-listing announcement. So no need for a prospectus. It's a pre-listing announcement. And really our main rationale and thinking around this is to say, let's create an expedited way without the necessarily regulatory um, and administrative burdens. So what we would look at is we would incorporate information by reference. Whatever is disclosed on the home exchange, you would then um, disclose that into the pre-listing announcement. So it's a very streamlined, effective way of listing and AB InBev in fact was the one that listed in 21 days. The other requirements that we look at is we look at spread 
And uh, again, those shareholders or that share capital can be spread around um, across both the local and the offshore register. Really what that means is that you might have to put in a script lending agreement in place. Um, and then also what our issuer regulation colleagues would look like is the um, MOI, particularly if the company is incorporated outside the borders of South Africa, just a broad review around um, those aspects that are included in those MOI and just to make sure that if there's anything that needs to be aligned. But I think in practice, um, particularly from the LSE, we've got 19 odd issuers that are cross-listed across our exchanges. That's a well-established process. So uh, there would be very little uh, nuances that would, that would pop out of that. Um, and then of course, any disclosure um, documents um, that they would uh, review. Corporate governance is important, is that again, where the company is incorporated, wherever the, uh, whatever the corporate governance code that is applicable to that, to, to that issuer, um, that would also apply um, in the South African context with, with perhaps, again, some nuances if there's some requirement for any alignment. And the important thing is that after, I know that speaking to a number of issuers, um, you know, there perhaps is some concern around the script lending agreement where you would usually typically put that in place, placing some direct to shareholders into the script lending agreement. We're looking, we look at about a 5%. Uh, um, and also what that means is that, um, you know, we want to make sure that the shares can be traded and settled quite easily, but that is released within a six to 12 month period. So it's a, it's an interim step that you put in place just to ensure clearing and settlement takes place. Um, so really that's Sam in terms of the admission criteria and maybe what I can touch on is just the ongoing obligations. And again, you know, I think from an exchange perspective, understanding um, that a number of global issuers are looking at consolidating their regulatory uh, 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 jurisdictions in terms of disclosure. Our inward listing framework is very flexible to say that if we have a company that's dual listed on the, on the exchange, um, there is a primary regulator and we typically take the lead in terms of that primary regulator and um, the obligations on that issuer. Um, where there might be certain nuances in terms of corporate actions, timetables, for example, we may just have to align. But again, given the fact that we've got such a, a, a long and standing relationship with London in particular, there shouldn't be any issues around alignment of timetables. So really on an ongoing basis, it is very flexible, easy to comply. Whatever you disclose in your home market, you would disclose in the, in the, in the South African markets. No, excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. And I think for me, the, the, the value proposition is to say um, you, you, you have a good listing in, in, in London, but here's another venue that can help you diversify both the type of investor. And I think that um, the serious CEO mentioned that not it's not just about the geographic and the number of investors but there is a different mindset and so that's that sometimes can give you good insights into into growing business but also an ability to to sell value to different types of investors who are looking at a particular company in in different ways um patricia one of the things that that he also mentioned was uh how cost effective we are do you want to touch on that Yes, of course. And, you know, I smile when I, when I, when I say this and kind of look at it because I was doing the conversions into uh, pounds and, um, well, let me take you through it. So when you list on the JSC, the JSC costs, you would uh, pay a documentation fee, which is the review of the prospectus, the pre-listing statement. Um, they converted into pounds. You're looking at 5,200 odd pounds. I mean, again, this is, this is really, marginal and, 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 and really cost effective. So on listing, you pay a documentation fee plus an initial listing fee. And the initial listing fee is based on the monetary value of the shares that you'll be placing. Um, so if you look at just broadly a market cap, a, a company with a market capitalization of 500,000 Rand, um, <laughs> again, you're looking at a JSE fee in terms of the minimum threshold of, of 89 pounds and a maximum of 185,000. Um, and that's for a company with a market capitalization of 50 billion Rand in terms of market cap. So again, you can see that from an initial listing perspective, really cost-effective um, 
And um, really, I mean, those figures uh, just kind of put it into perspective. This does exclude third party advisory costs, but also, you know, the ongoing cost of compliance and the ongoing cost of listing is also a consideration. And from an ongoing annual listing fee perspective, so the year that you uh, list, the following year, then you'll be listing, uh, uh, build an annual listing fee. That's based on a market cap uh, on an average market capitalization for the previous year. Um, and just looking at those bands at a minimum, you're looking at 2,700 pounds and a maximum of 24,000 pounds. And yet I wanna say there's, there's, there's more room for discounts. So we still apply a 30% discount on that for, inward, for any inward listed stocks. So again, really cost effective. Um, and may I also stress this does exclude the third party advisory costs, um, but, but really from a, from a JSC perspective, um, I mean, I think those figures just speak for themselves, Sam. Thanks, thanks, Patricia, agreed. Um, just a reminder to all our attendees, uh, if you do have questions, um, please uh, throw them in the chat. Um, we will be having a, a Q&A session a little bit later. Um, maybe back to, to you, Will. Um, can you talk us through just, you know, once a company is listed, the opportunities for capital raise um, within the South African uh, uh, context. You know, one of the statistics that's really um, impressed me was in, in 2020, the um, amount of capital raised on the exchange as secondary capital. So these are existing companies uh, doing kind of share placements um rights issues etc um doubled uh from 2019 to to 2020 i think we hit about um close to 70 billion rand and and that really spoke to me about the the, the benefits of being a high quality listed company that in the event of a crisis like we had last year in terms of covid and that we're still working through that companies could quickly come to the market and um, and raise capital to show up balance sheets to to make sure that they can uh, be resilient through the crisis and and to also take advantage of, of of some of the market movements that we had so so maybe will you can just um talk us through a little bit about your experiences um from a capital raise perspective and and and, and any advice that that you can give somebody uh who's already listed looking to do so yeah, so I mean, I, I, I don't think I had much value on the advice piece. I mean, maybe, you know, Richard uh, talks more, more of the corporates there. Let me just talk sure. to the investor piece. I mean, um, mm. you know, AA, we've been fortunate. We've had a very sort of dominant share in, in placements uh, this year. So we've participated and seen a lot of that. Um, they haven't actually been that defensive, to be completely honest. You know, there's been a lot of sort of corporate restructuring or guys actually looking for uh, growth opportunities. The one thing I would highlight, though, is that um, your average discounts have compressed quite markedly, right? Um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Richard will, will know, I mean, we do this stuff all the time. Um, you know, I used to see sort of 10% discounts when people were placing sort of, you know, a couple of billion rand. That is squeezed a lot. I mean, it's, it's very competitive in terms of uh, these book builds now, both in terms of the big domestic institutions that see them as a real liquidity opportunity, right? So, um, you know, we had a, a big disc game placement founder selling recently, a big Cornerstone investor used that as a real opportunity, uh, liquidity event, an opportunity to get a slug that would take them months to get in the market and was willing to, you know, pay quite a tight discount for that privilege, right? So, I mean, that's, that's very much the, um, the sort of one side of the equation. And again, just to give everyone a sense of the developed nature of these markets, I mean, you would see every single big global hedge fund that runs a placement pr process would be in our book builds almost every time. Assuming the liquidity profile is there, these guys are there as well, right? Um, and again, just for everyone on the call, you know, that is all your big brand name global funds. And again, they with this big, big domestic pool of trap capital have meant that these discounts have been, um, have been much tighter than I've seen for, uh, for a long time. In terms of the corporate experience, I think, I think, I think Richard, you're going to be probably better placed to, uh, to deal with that. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Will. Um, Richard, over to you. Your your experience on the the, the capital raises um, from your side. I think um, maybe just to build on, on on what Will covered. I mean, you know, b b before I moved down to South Africa, you know, ten years or so ago, I kind of covered Africa alongside the Middle East, 
and, and Eastern Europe. And, and I have to say, you know, the South African market has, has always been the market in which it's e easier uh, to, to raise capital. And again, we've talked about the dynamics about this kind of large deep pool of trapped liquidity. You know, that, 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 makes, that makes it very easy for companies, whether it's domestic South African companies or inwardly listed companies to, to, to raise capital. Um, but it's not just about the ease of raising capital. You know, it is also about the quality of institutions that you can access if you do put a, in place a listing on the JSC. And I remember, I remember at the listing event uh, for, for Glencore in 2013. That was a company that, that that I helped list on the JSC. You know, the CEO at the time, Ivan Glazenberg, you know, said that you know, and 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 let's be honest, Glencore is a big global company. He, he stood up in front of you know everybody and said he was blown away by the quality of engagement that he had with. Uh, South African based investors as he'd been marketing the listing you know and this is a CEO who you know speaks to investors across all parts of the world um, and, and he said that the quality of engagement the quality of understanding uh, and ultimately therefore the, the quality of, of, of support he could rely upon from the South African investor base was really important to him and something that he 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 had acknowledged and 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 known about, but but, but had, hadn't fully appreciated. That he'd actually come down to South Africa and spent time with these investors. And I think that the final point I'd make, and Sam, you touched upon it um, earlier, is you know what what why why is this relevant? Why why is it helpful to have access to this incre incremental pool of capital? It's it's simply because it's been proven that the more diverse your shareholder register, the less volatile your stock is, and certainly as you heard from the CEO of Sirius. Um, the more access to capital you do have through your listing structure, uh, the better chance you have of your stock, uh, you know, tra trading, trading well and re-rating. Um, and, and that's just in the normal course of events. But obviously, if we come back to kind of the ease of raising capital, it does also mean that your ability to raise capital, the execution risk around those types of transactions, you know, I think is severely reduced if you have the ability to tap not just your existing, pre-existing kind of investor base of your primary listing, but, but having the ability to access uh, the South African institutional market as well. Uh, excellent, excellent. Thanks, thanks, Richard. So I think um, at this stage, we're gonna go uh, round the table for some kind of closing thoughts from, from, from panelists. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, Patricia, and then, uh, to Will and, and to Richard. And then I will then um, uh, talk about an exciting project that, that we as the JSE are um, embarked on, which is to say that alongside our public market, we are looking to develop um, a solution in, in, in the private market um, that, that, that's really uh, very exciting at this stage. But why don't we have some uh, closing thoughts uh, from you, Patricia, and then, and then we'll go into Will and then Richard. Thanks, Sam. So um, I think just from my perspective, and again, on behalf of the JSE, just thank you very much for the British Chamber to putting this forum together. Um, hopefully in this forum, we have managed to illustrate the ease um, and the appetites for these uh, dual listed companies. And um, of course, you know, if you are an advisor, if you are a company considering accessing um, the local or the South African um, capital markets, please engage with us. Um, you know, uh, 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 Will and Richard have both alluded to the fact that our investors are looking for more Rand Hedge um, uh, exposure. And I think that's really where these dual listings do play. So, um, yeah, I think from, from, from a JSC perspective, you know, we have, we have driven the point quite hard to say easy, flexible, fast and efficient way of accessing the markets and, 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 and please engage with us. Thanks, Patricia. Will? Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, for, for um, you know, offshore corporates, I mean, I just see it as a very, a very cheap optionality. I mean, Patricia, you frame the costs, it's not going to move the needle in, in anyone's life. Uh, and I'm just saying, you know, that provides you access to, as I said, one, a very big and two, very trapped pool of capital and be an investor base that is often willing to pay a premium to solve for that problem, right? To the benefit of hopefully corporates that you advise. I think it is pretty much as simple as that. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. And uh, over to you, Richard, for your final comments. 
I'm really not sure there's much more to add. I think you know, I think I think Patricia and Will have some some summarised it well. It's 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 the cost benefit analysis. Um, I guess we've we've covered a lot of ground on this discussion. Uh, there's perhaps been quite a bit to take in, but 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 that's how I you know, distill it all down. You know, the cost benefit analysis, in my view, stacks up very well. Um, but obviously, very keen and, and very uh, willing to, to spend time with people, you know, post this this discussion if they do want to learn more and go through it in in, in a slightly slower pace. Fantastic! Thank you, thank you so much uh, to our panelists. Uh, really engaging conversation about uh, the benefits of of an inward listing uh, onto the JSE.